Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming here tonight. It's Friday night, and I feel like I need to entertain you because it's Friday night and you're here. Um, so, um, yes, my name is Aga, and I found out a couple days ago that, it's, <laughs> that that's what it means. It could be a lot worse, right? Um, just a little bit about me so you know where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm really Polish. I grew up, I was born and I grew up in Poland. Then I lived in the UK and then in Germany. Then for 10 years I lived in Chicago and I recently moved to San Francisco. So it seems like I'm moving this way. So maybe Japan sometime soon, right? These are my highlights from this year. Actually, this, these are the two coolest things that have happened to me this year. Uh, one was uh, like yesterday. Who was there yesterday? Who saw my talk yesterday? Okay, so some people did, some people didn't. Um, yeah, I got to touch the human brain and smell it and all that. Uh, so that was one highlight. And the second one was I actually got to pet a cheetah, a real cheetah. Um, and he was purring, by the way. He was purring loudly. Um, I work for a company called User Centric. Uh, it's a research, it's a user experience research and design company uh, based in Chicago, but we have offices globally. Um, and these are some of the studies that I usually get involved with. Um, a lot of user research. I don't personally do design. I'm a researcher. I do research. I, um, I love research methods. Um, and I'm a psychologist um, and, and human factors researcher by um, training. And you can see some of our studies, a lot of our studies have to do um, are in the healthcare field. There's some in automotive. We do some studies about packaging. Um, there's a study here with the camera. Um, so we do products as well as interfaces. Um, a whole bunch of, so there's a lot of variety in what I do, which is really interesting. But really people know me um, for eye tracking. And that's me wearing um, eye tracking glasses. So people know me for eye tracking. And that's why I'm here talking about eye tracking. And please, during the talk, please feel free to interrupt. This is a small group, and I think we have time for questions during instead of you know you holding it until the very end. Okay, so this is what we what I wanted to cover today, and probably we will get to some of the mo most important topics, but not maybe not to some of the less important topics. Um, a short introduction. Then, how do you know that you need eye tracking? A lot of people don't know. People buy an eye tracker and they, they go like, what am, I gonna, what, what am I supposed to do with it now? So how do you know that you need it? What can we measure? So some of the quantitative stuff. Then we're, we're going to talk about qualitative analysis. And we probably will not get to how to's, because this is sort of the nitty gritty stuff. This is where I, where I do my, uh, I do my uh, one day workshops. That's what we talk about the second part of the day. So let's start with an introduction. And let me tell you a little story. This is actually important to set the stage for this presentation. This is Bobby, the intern. And Bobby was asked, this has nothing to do with eye tracking for, for just a second. But Bobby, there was a study, and Bobby was the data, he was the note taker, and then he had to enter the data for the study. And in this study, it was a usability study. We gathered sort of simple data, such as, you know, for each participant, we had three tasks. There was outcome of the task, success or failure. Um, time on task, if they exceeded, exceeded five minutes, then we scored it as a failure, and then the participant rated their satisfaction at the end. So Bobby, the intern, entered all this data into the spreadsheet, and I asked Bobby, well, it would be really interesting if we could separate the failures from successes, and we could analyze them separately, because these are sort of two different things. And he said, and I said, could you sort this table by um, success versus failure? And he said, Oh, please, of course I can, I know how to sort, I'll do it. Um, and this is what he came up with. So I got the spreadsheet, and I had failures here, successes here, which is what I wanted, but then I started looking at it, and what is this, exceeded five minutes, but it was a success, something went wrong. Something went wrong in the spreadsheet. Do you know what he did? So what he did is this is how he sorted this spreadsheet. He selected the column, and then he basically sorted by that column instead of sorting the entire table. And that's what we that's what he came up with. And he said, oh, sure, I can sort. Don't worry about it. So this is what I called knowing just enough to be dangerous. He knew a little bit of Excel, 
but not quite enough uh, to make it actually correct. So this is another something that you might be more familiar with you. Honey, I got this. There's a problem, right? With maybe with the, the, the water is leaking. Honey, I've, I've got this, right? The next thing you know, this is what you're doing. Um, so this is, come on. No, that's OK. It's perfect timing. So I really want to start with this concept because this is what we're facing um, in the eye tracking world a little bit right now. So knowing just enough to be dangerous. And what does this mean? I looked it up on Yahoo. Best answer, it means that the person thinks they know enough to do something, but they only know enough to make them feel confident enough to try it when they are sure to fail, probably disastrously. Now, what does this have to do with eye tracking? And I talked about this yesterday a little bit, that eye tracking used to be really difficult a while back. This is what eye tracking used to be like. And even when I went to grad school, and that was probably 15 years ago, we did studies with a bite bar. So you had an eye tracker on your, on your head, and there was a bite bar, a, 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 a wooden sort of thing that you had to bite, because that would stabilize your head. And that means you're not going to move, because the eye tracker was very, very sensitive to movement. And then data analysis took, I mean, weeks and months. We did it manually. Everything was so manual and so difficult. Um, it's another example. It really was. so. At the time, and this is a little bit more recent, in the Academy of Sciences, when I, the Chinese Academy of Sciences that I visited, um, uh, this professor here, this eye tracker basically, you put it on, on, on the subject's head, and then you have to like, there's a little knob that you have to screw a little bit to make it tight. And you can see that he screwed it a little bit too hard, and I went, ah! So you can see that this stuff was actually, it used to be hard, but now, these days, today's eye trackers basically are getting easier and easier to use. So this is, a, this is good, but this is also bad. So these are um, the glasses that I was wearing. No, these are different eye tracking glasses than what I was wearing before. Here's another eye tracker, um, a Toby eye tracker that's, that's built into the monitor. Uh, this is actually one of our participants. We went to do a study, and they, our participants thought it was really cool to wear the glasses, so they were posing for pictures. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is another eye tracker, very similar. This one is built into the, um, uh, into the car. So even a child, it's so easy now, and not just the, sort of for the participant, but also for the researcher. It's so easy that even a child could run a study and make a heat map. And one of these days, like I keep saying this, but one of these days I'm actually going to teach like a seven-year-old to do it and I'm going to prove it. I'm going to get it on video and I'm going to prove it, right? Because you can, with the touch of a button, you can actually generate a heat map. So many of these people who have eye trackers and do these things, they know just enough to be dangerous. Everybody's like, yeah, I can do eye tracking. Everybody can do eye tracking now. So many of them know just enough to be dangerous and that's a problem. Um, they produce a lot of visualizations um, or just watch people's eye movements during the study, and that's pretty much it. Um, I compare it to tea leaf reading. It's like you go and you go, mm, I think you're going to die soon, or you know, like when fortune tellers and all that. Um, and with a heat map, if you can heat, with heat maps, you can tweak the settings and you can basically make a heat map look like anything. I can, I can adjust the settings of a heat map to. To, to prove basically any point you want. Um, so heat maps are not the best for this, uh, for analysis. Um, and also in, our, in, our, uh, in the user experience field, that's, this is what I do, a lot of researchers started comparing eye tracking to the non-scientific methods, like such as this one. So it is a problem. Um, heat maps and all these outputs are pretty, but they're not actionable and they're frustrating. Frustrating for, uh, for clients who come to my company and they want answers, they have a project, they have a product a lot of times and they want to know what is wrong with my product. People are uh, calling and telling me that it's not working, I want to know why. Um, if we just do heat maps, it's not going to really give them a lot of answers. And stakeholders are already are frustrated with companies who provide heat maps and, and basically don't tell them much insight. So, 
back in the day when eye tracking started, when I started doing eye tracking, it was probably 15 years ago, but commercially since 2003. Um, and at, at that point, everybody was really, really excited. But now I feel like, and I, so I've been doing this for a while, and I feel like the hype is really over. People are no longer that excited. So what do we do now? Nobody's excited anymore. So now eye tracking really has to bring something to the table. And we talked about the pictures that I pick for the, do you know how long it takes to pick a picture that's right for the idea? Um, so eye tracking has to bring something to the table. It has to deliver value. Um, it has to be useful now, actually. So I say, so the, sort of the reason I give these presentations is because I really want to make sure that practitioners, these are experienced practitioners, do a little bit less tea leaf reading and more science. And by science, I don't mean chemistry or biology or anything like that, but I'm really talking about behavioral sciences and things like systematic, objective, rigorous, all that really needs to be inserted back into eye tracking, which is originally where that was in eye tracking when we were doing it in the academic world, but now it's not so much anymore. So the two main ideas I wanted to talk to you about today is focusing on return on investment when using eye tracking, so making eye tracking actually useful, and also practicing good science. So let's talk about return on investment. But here I want to make a caveat, just because I'm talking to you and you guys are at a university. Eye tracking at universities versus eye tracking um, in the sort of uh, done by a practitioner, that could be a little bit different. When I did eye tracking at a university, we were not thinking about return on investment. We were thinking about a lot of ba basic science, trying to figure out how people visually consume certain things. So it was less for a practical purpose and more for knowledge. So what I'm talking, this presentation is not really about academic research that you're doing to publish in an academic journal. It's more when somebody has a product that they want to improve or they have three different designs of a medication label and they want to know which one is best, which one will cause fewer errors and fewer problems. That's when I'm talking about eye tracking, I talk about sort of the practical use of eye tracking. So forget about academic research and think about practical um, now. And the so what problem of eye tracking that's very, very common right now, um, Basically, you look at a heat map and you go, like, so, so what, so what? So this usually happens to me. The client comes, so this is me, or a researcher, a UX researcher. The client comes and says, I want an eye tracking study. And then I ask, okay, what are the study objectives? And the client says, I want to know where people are looking. I hate that. I absolutely hate this because this is really not... This, the problem is this is not an action. This is not an acceptable objective. This is this doesn't mean anything. Where people are looking, what are what are we going to learn from this? Um, heat maps are not very actionable. Again, so what? So if this was your website, and we eye tracked your website, and this is a heat map that came out of it, is your website good? Is it bad? Is there a problem? I have absolutely no idea. I don't know. Even when even. Numbers, when we look at numbers and measures, and in this case we have where did participants spend their, their time looking? Uh, numbers, seemingly you feel like, oh, this is more objective, this is a little better than a heat map. Still, it's a so what problem. So what that they looked at something 49% of the time. So we have this problem that we don't really know what to do with these, with these results. Um, so all of these eye tracking outputs are interesting, but really we don't need interesting insight, we need actionable insight. We have to think about what decisions will this output help us make. And usually we either are trying to decide uh, how something should be improved, or uh, is something good enough to, to go to market, for example? Is the website good enough to be, to be out? So how can eye, eye tracking be actionable? And on one hand, we have qualitative insight or qualitative research, formative research. And in this, this case, we use eye tracking to detect usability problems or explain how a problem that we already observed uh, as a researcher, how a problem occurred. Uh, and how is it actionable? Well, if we know exactly how something happened, it leads to a lot better recommendations, design recommendations. And on the other hand, we have quantitative insights, so summative research, validation studies, 
And in this case, we use eye tracking to measure things, measure, usually measure differences between different designs when we have different um, options, or maybe our design and the competitor's design. And in this case, it helps us make better um, business decisions, to choose a design or, or evaluate our progress. Qualitative analysis is, is done more based on visualizations, and we talked about this yesterday a little bit, so gaze plots especially, and quantitative analysis, it's all measures. So how, and we're gonna talk about both of the, these qualitative and quantitative in just a minute, but how do, I, how do I decide that I need eye tracking, or maybe I don't? I'm gonna to talk to you about this decision tree that I came up with. That's how I decide if a study needs eye tracking. I don't know if you can see this very well, maybe not, but so there are four questions that I usually ask myself. The first question is, will eye tracking generally generate actionable insight addressing my study objectives? And let me give you examples. So on one hand, it can, we can, so what is an example for no? Let's say that the study goal is to understand, we have an app, let's say, and we wanna understand um, what new app features would, be, uh, would enhance the user experience. In this case, eye tracking is not a useful uh, tool for this. Obviously, we, we're not gonna address usefulness or utility with eye tracking. So on, if this is my study objective and, and a client wants eye tracking, I already tell them eye tracking is really not, not very useful and at this point, we're not doing it because it's, it's stupid. Um, now, what's a good example for yes? Let's say the study goal is to determine if a new drug label um, is easily differentiated from existing labels. That's a good objective that actually eye tracking can help us answer, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, but th in this case, I would proceed to the next question. So I have yes and I can proceed. The next question is, will eye tracking provide more or better insight than cheaper and faster methods, like for example, heuristic evaluation or user testing? If it's yes, that's great. We can do, let's do eye tracking. If it's no, oh, and in this case, here's an example. If your question is which package design will draw more attention, there is no other method that can really answer this question other than eye tracking. Um, I can ask people, do you, do you know, this, this is an actual thing that happened. I don't know if, I don't think this affected Europe. I'm not sure actually. Um, this is um, the Tropicana juice. Um, very, very popular juice. This, this was the previous, um, or the original package. And Pepsi rolled out this new package based on focus groups and all the research that they did except for eye tracking and, and anything good like that. Um, they rolled out a new package. They lost so much money. Uh, when this package basically replaced this one, nobody could see it, nobody could find it, nobody could recognize it. It didn't, it didn't attract enough attention. Um, they had to roll back the old package after they lost millions and millions of dollars. So in this case, had they used eye tracking, I think they would have been a little bit ahead of the game here, knowing that this is not a successful package. So. Yes, eye tracking in this case would deliver more or better insight than other methods that we can think of. But if no, I'm still not saying let's not do eye tracking. Um, here's an example. When assessing the efficiency of a new site layout, time on task could suffice. Oh, here's an example when eye tracking could actually, it, does, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the simplest method. For, if you're interested in the um, efficiency on, on your website, I could look at the number of fixations it takes you to go somewhere or find something. I could just as well measure time. So in this case, uh, eye tracking maybe is not, it's not gonna provide me more in, with more insight or better insight, but I'm still not going to say I'm not gonna do eye tracking. There's another question that I wanna ask myself, which is, do I need triangulation? And by triangulation, I mean, Triangulation is really a validation of data through cross-verification from multiple sources of me or methods. Let me give you an example here. Yes, so a lot of times triangulation is important in healthcare studies where we wanna have more backup for our data. Um, sometimes we need to convince stakeholders and that's really the question number four, which is, is buy-in, is, 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 do we need to convince stakeholders of our results? So for example, 
do they need to see the scattered, plot, the scattered gaze plots to, for me to convince them that people really had trouble finding something? Sometimes when we tell stakeholders people wouldn't find this button, they say, yeah, yeah, they just, we're going to make it bigger or something like that. But if they actually see the gaze plot or the gaze replay, they finally go, oh, I see, this really took such a lot, so many, I mean, they can see this in, 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 in action, how long it took and how inefficient it was. So if you feel that your study needs increased attention uh, from the organization, then it's, it's always good to have eye tracking involved. In this case, so if the answer is yes, I would do eye tracking. If no, then there's no point. If, if I don't need to convince anybody, there's no point in doing eye tracking. So really, it boils down to four questions. Actionable insight. Sim is it the simplest method? Do we need triangulation of results? Do we need buy-in? For actionable insight, for, my, for, my, for, for the studies that I do, the answer has to be yes. We need to have something actionable. And then I need at least one, of yes, one, of one yes to these three questions for me to feel like I, I can do or I should be doing eye tracking. So now the next part talks about what can we measure. So we talked about the qualitative insight on one hand and quantitative, but we're focusing on this side right now. So when we use eye tracking to measure differences between things. In Toby Studio, so one of the software applications, I don't know exactly what yours looks like. Hopefully it's also pretty easy to figure out. Um, there are several different measures available uh, for your data. Um, there, there are really over 100 different measures that you can use with eye tracking. Um, but not all of them are really relevant to the user experience researcher. Most of them are actually not relevant to us. Um, this is what I see when, when, when I talk about measures or what people find out about measures. The one reaction some people have is, whoa, measures, I'm not touching that. I'm just going to do qualitative research, not doing any measures. Now, that's almost not as bad as this reaction when people find out, when people who buy an eye tracker and have the software and find out that there's so, me so many measures available, they go a little crazy and they start selecting a lot of them. So then they select a lot of the measures that are available just because they are available, but there's a problem. I see a lot of reports with too many measures reported and that makes for very bloated reports, leads to confusion from the client perspective, lack of interest, and really the point here is that every measure has a meaning. So every measure, like for example, the number of fixations or fixation duration, it can be translated into a cognitive process. So every measure has a meaning. The problem is that sometimes a measure can have two or three meanings, depending on the context in which it's being used. The manual for any software, any eye tracking software, is going to explain how each measure is obtained, but it's not going to tell you what it indicates in terms of cognitive processes. Uh, and what's important is to choose measures with study type and research questions in mind. Kind of like when you're choosing your shoes in the morning, you can't just grab any shoes because, not, not for, this is not for guys, guys can't relate to this, but girls. Um, you, you can't just choose any shoes with, with, with your outfit, right? It, it's, it's carefully selected. That's the same thing you do for eye tracking. I see you're like not relating to no. it, right? No. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> And here's a, a, an email that I, I, I got. Somebody read a paper uh, of mine, and uh, she asks, in my studies, I always look at time to first fixation and total number of fixations in each AOI. Should I also use visit count and visit duration per AOI? I have absolutely no idea. And that's, that was, initially, I was going to give her this answer. I, I was going to say just, I have absolutely no idea in all capital letters because and then I politely added, please tell me about your study objectives. Because I can't tell you what, what you need to be using if I don't know what your studies are. And just saying that all my studies have this and this, that's, that's uh, unless all of our, this person's studies are of the same kind, maybe. So, there are two types of ide identified, so in order to pick your measures, you have to kind of know where you're, what, what kind of study you're doing. 
And um, you could be either measuring performance related differences, so you're, you're focusing on performance, measuring performance. And here are some examples. Uh, in this particular study, um, we went to call center application. So here's an example of, of an objective. Will the redesigned layout make information easier to find and compare? So think of a call center where people call and complain about something, uh, or usually they complain, yes, they complain. Um, and what they wanted to do is they had a single, so all the call center representatives, they had a single monitor, and they had this really complicated application. So what this organization decided to do is they decided to give them two monitors and give them two applications that were, apparently they were supposed to be easier to use. But what we did, is when we put an eye tracker on them and we wanted to compare the, effect, the efficiency, we started seeing a lot of gays, there were so many times that they had to go back and forth, back and forth between the, moni between the two monitors, and we could easily demonstrate that that was really not very efficient. Um, the information was just not really laid out very well, especially across the two monitors. So that's, that's, that, that would be measuring performance. Um, another study goal, uh, think of pharmacists. Um, we've done a lot of research with pharmaceutical labels. Um, when a new drug label is designed, we really want to make sure that it's easily distinguishable from the other drug labels because the pharmacists can make a mistake, and they actually do. They, they make, there's 4% error, I think in the US. When you go to your pharmacy, there's a 4% chance that you will be dispensed the wrong medication. Not necessarily the wrong medication, but sometimes the wrong, there's a 4% chance of error, but it could be like, there, you need to get 30 pills, there's gonna be 31, so it's not necessarily that you're gonna die. But there's, there's error. Um, so we wanna make sure that these drugs are significantly different from each other. So that, that's when eye tracking can measure performance, and we're gonna talk about measures in just a minute. Mental workload, let's say a GPS in a car. Um, and I, w the example that comes to mind is uh, a, an Acura GPS versus a BMW GPS. BMW has a very terrible system in their cars. And Acura has a much better system. And I feel like when you're driving and there's so much going on outside, let's say you're in an unfamiliar city, you know, it's, it's raining, maybe it's dark, there's so much going on, you really want to make sure that the GPS system is easy to use. And there's certain measures, uh, eye tracking measures, um, that can compare, can nicely compare the, the mental workload that each GPS is inducing on the, on the customer. Um, and the last example is about ease of information processing. So let's say that we're studying patient inserts or instructions, any kind of instructions on the screen. Um, eye tracking can help us compare them in terms of how easy they are to read and understand with the measures that I'll tell you about in just a second. But the second group of, of, of studies that you might be conducting, and this is where eye tracking really is irreplaceable. When you're measuring attraction related differences, and what I mean by that is, for example, which screen location will make my ad more visible? Is it at the bottom, is it better at the bottom, is it better at the top? Um, which, which, uh, which one of these um, ad designs will create more interest? So we have multiple versions. We don't know which one will be most, most effective. Um, packaging studies, like I mentioned, on shelves, which package or which even, which shelf location is best for products to be noticed. Uh, and on websites, on the, on the website, a business that has a website, they know which, which areas of the website they want people to see, and that's easy to, to get from eye tracking. So the reason why you need to know whether you're measuring performance-related differences or, or, or attraction related differences is because this depends on the measures that you'll be selecting or, or your measures depend on that and also the interpretation of your measure will depend on that so we have two different kinds of measures measures of performance and measures of attraction now this yesterday if you were there yesterday I showed this but on the Mac it was a complete garbage um, and you don't have to know we're going to talk about each of them separately uh, but basically, measures used in, in user experience, here, here are the measures of attraction, like for example, area noticeability measures, interest, emotional arousal, and then we have performance, such as mental workload, 
ease of information processing, etc. And then the measures are listed here, like pupil diameter, number of fixations. And the interesting thing is that, for example, a lot of times people at conference, they ask me, uh, what about number of fixations? What if, I, if I measure the number of fixations it takes people to, to do something, what does that mean? But I always say it depends, because it actually depends on the kind of study you're doing. If you're doing a performance-related study, the number of fixations is usually no good, not, not very good, because then it, it's, it's efficiency. The more fixations, the less efficiency. That's not good. But if it's an attraction-related study and you want your package to stand out, your ad to stand out, more fixations, that's good. There's more interest. So the interpretation of the measure depends on what kind of study you're doing. So it's good to know what you're doing first. We're going to talk about measures of, of attraction first. So I feel like on this side, this is really irrefutable. So the, the value of eye tracking in this, uh, when you're measuring attraction, there's really no other way to get this data. Measures of performance, there are other ways. So eye tracking a lot of times is used as, as a sort of to triangulate your results. But on this side, there's no, no doubt in my mind that that's, if you're doing those kind of studies, you do need eye tracking. Um, let's talk about noticeability measures first. They help you determine how easy an area or an object was to notice. And some of the measures will include the participants, the percentage of participants who actually looked at something, the number of fixations they made before they looked at something, or the time it took them to look at something. And a lot of times, these obviously these two last, the last two measures are related. Um, and when I talk about fixations, do, does everybody understand at least a little bit what I'm talking about when I talk about fixations? Our, our eye movements, the, the eye movements that we study in our studies, is, they're called saccadic eye movements. And basically what they do is they jump. So this is a fixation, this is a saccade. So I look here, and then I look here, and I look here, and then I look here. So these are the fixations. These are where the eye basically stops for a little bit. Um, let's say 100 milliseconds to sometimes a lot more. And then the saccades are, are very, very, very quick. This is where information processing takes place, and the saccades are basically the jumps in between the places where I'm going to take my information from. So I could be counting the number of fixations here, but a lot of times this measure, or this measure is related to the, to the time and, and when I re present my results, I really like to use the time rather than the number of fixations because it's easier to understand by people who read my reports. Uh, I don't have to explain what a fixation is. Um, and also defining a fixation, it's, a, it's an arbitrary process and there are problems there, um, so that's why I go with time. So back to this question. Let's say that 85% of participants, and I'm talk, we're talking about noticeability, 85% of participants fixated on the ad up here, but 70% fixated on the one at the bottom. And then I also talk about the time. So I talk about percentage of participants and also time, how soon they noticed this particular um, element. So 0.5 fixations here, 1.9 fixations here. So that's, that's one example. Now, measures of interest are a little bit different. So these measures are not about how much something jumps out at you, but once you look at something, how long or how much you look at that thing. So in this case, if you look at this picture, what do you see? Does anybody see the cat? OK, good. Who are you people? I look at the cat. But see, the, 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 the printer. This does not make my point. The printer doesn't make my point. Um, the thing is, so this is my illustration of, of while the apple in the previous example, it jumps out at you, it, it's highly noticeable. This cat here is probably not the first thing your eyes are drawn to. Uh, but once you look at it, you go, huh, that's interesting. So there, there are probably more fixations there because you're like, eh, this doesn't really fit here. Uh, or what is it exactly? You have to spend a little bit more time to figure it out. So it does create a little bit more interest. And we can measure it uh, in the number of fixations on this particular area of interest. 
time that you spend on the area of interest, which is I, what I would go with usually, um, and or the percentage of time you spend compared to the, the page or whatever it is that you want to put it in context sometimes. So noticeability a lot of times depends on the physical characteristics of the thing, color, movement. Interest is more about the content, about what you're looking at. So in this example, uh, let's say we're reporting the total dwell time from entry to exit on this particular area of interest. Um, and here we can say that participants spent, this is just a hypothetical example, participants spent two seconds looking at this ad, whoever was, let's say, waiting for a bus, and in this case, 4.2 seconds looking at this ad. Now, can we say, um, well, this one wins. If this is what McDonald's is trying to decide between, this one is a winner. Why not? It's uh, complex to recognize. That it's, that it's what? Difficult to recognize? Okay. Okay. I'm looking for something even, or even sort of lower level than what you're saying. So one thing is, but that is a good point. Ads, people who make ads, they want the ads to stand out, so to be noticed right away, but they also want the ads to, once they grab your attention, to hold the attention. Because if the ad is all only just moving around and flashing, and once you look at it, you go, oh, I'm not really interested in it, that's not good. You, you need to, it needs to be noticed, and then it needs to maintain that attention. So in this case, theoretically speaking, this result could, could, could mean, yes, this is a good, this is, this is the better ad, especially if this difference was statistically significant. But there are a couple of things missing here. We don't know. We don't know what participants are being included in this measure. So if, you, if I see something like this in the report, I am confused. Because you could be reporting, is this, how many participants looked at it? And are, these only, are you taking into consideration only the ones that looked? Let's say we had 20 participants in the study, and only two of them looked at this one, but 20 looked at that one. But those two, on average, 4.2 seconds. Well, that's not good enough. So we need to put it in context. I always, always, always report noticeability together with interest. So I say how many participants looked. So 95% of the participants who looked, uh, who walked by the bus stop looked at the ad and they spent 4.2 seconds looking at it. And now it's clear that only I'm talking about that this average 4.2 seconds is about the participants who looked. So the zero for the participants who didn't look, I'm not taking that into consideration. And then in this case, let's say 94% looked, and they spent two seconds on it. So the same noticeability level, um, but a little bit more interest here. So people spent longer looking at this particular ad. Uh, or, and the reason is, yeah, it is not clear, but it's kind of interesting. Like you look at it and you're like, what is this? Why is it, what does it look like a salad in there? So it, it would be more effective in this case. So again, bringing noticeability interest together, this was an actual study um, that was done at, at a Walmart, uh, and we were looking at prepaid packaging. The noticeability and interest related to prepaid packaging, prepaid, prepaid cell phones packaging, yes. So in this case, this is an individual participant. Um, so AT&T, this particular package, had higher noticeability, it was noticed sooner, but this one here got a lot more fixation, so it got more interest. So this is again, um, is yeah. It could, it could, but also we always look at the task. What is the task? If the task is to pick out a phone, if you don't understand something, you move on to something that you understand. This was, in this particular case, this was related to, actually, this, this phone didn't get as much interest from the other participant, but this participant, her daughter already had this phone. That's why it, it got more interest. So, but the thing is that interest could be related to a lot of, so it could be caused by a lot of different things. And we, if we don't talk to the participants, we may not know. It could also be some sort of confusion. Um, but in attraction-related studies, the confusion is rare, more rare of an explanation than in performance-related studies. 
And emotional arousal, my favorite measure that I talked a little bit about yesterday, um, pupil diameter. So emotional arousal, my pupil diameter. So the larger your pupils get, when, when you meet somebody that you like or you're excited about something, your pupils get larger. And eye trackers also measure that. Um, now, it is a challenging measure because pupil size could be affected by several different things. So when you're doing an experiment or a study, you have to control for a lot of different factors. Like, for example, pupil size can also be affected by um, fatigue. So you're getting tired um, and, and, and your pupils are getting a little bit um, smaller. Enlarged pupils can indicate lying. So here's an example when people, sometimes when people play poker, uh, when they get a good hand, their pupils get larger. So they, one of the reasons why they have, um, when they, why, why they wear um, sunglasses is so you couldn't, you can't tell. But what, sorry? It's not about the bad luck. No. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's basically, right. So other reasons, oh, pupil size, this is actually the biggest one. Very sensitive to lighting. So if you have a lab and you're, you really want to measure pupil diameter, uh, you need to make sure that you don't have windows or you have really, really good shades. Like these would not be good enough. Um, so windowless lab is, is best. And also, um, what you're measuring. So if the, let's say these are the stimuli that we're, that we're looking at, we're comparing, let's say emotional arousal on these three different stimuli. This one is lighter than this one. So that's another problem. That's something that also has to be controlled for. Now, another problem is that emotional arousal. So let's say the pupils are dilating. We think, yes, we have a winning design. This is a good thing. Actually, maybe not, because this could be either good or bad. So they did a study with babies. So the babies are not here because I like babies. I would rather put cats here, but um, the ba I'm watching you. <laughs> the babies are here because they actually did a study with babies. And um, so one condition was ba uh, participants heard the babies crying. Uh, the second condition was babies laughing. And the third condition was a neutral condition, some neutral office noise. And the pupils got larger when people heard babies laughing and babies crying. So it could be bad or good. So it's a little harder to interpret. Uh, it's a nice measure, hard to interpret, hard to control for. Um, so we have to be very good and probably interview people afterwards what, what their reaction was. So how do you capture those? Is it because you're filming the the pupil diameter is captured, uh, it's a byproduct of, of the eye tracker. It, it, every eye tracker, yeah, every eye tracker will know what the pupil diameter is because it has to figure out your, the center of your pupil. Mm -hmm. It could be easier or harder, depending on the software, it, that measure could be easier or harder to get out of uh, the software, yeah. Like Toby, for example, it's not easily obtainable, but, <laughs> right, so you have to go to raw data and you actually have to do a little bit more manual work, yeah. And the last uh, limitation of pupil diameter is that it's very idiosyncratic, which means just by nature, my pupils might be just bigger than, than your pupils. It's just, it's just the way it is. So we have to compare. Everybody has their own baseline. And when we, anal we analyze changes, we don't look at the absolute um, size, let's say in millimeters. We look at how the pupil changed. So we give somebody, if we give participants, let's say, uh, uh, something neutral to look at, something gray, a gray background, and then we see how their pupils changed from that. So the measures of attraction determine the impact of a design on users' awareness, interest, and desire, uh, but the measures of performance. Oh. We have measures of mental workload, cognitive processing, target findability, and target noticeability. Well, I guess that's the same thing again. Uh, mental workload is first because actually pupil diameter, unfortunately, can also measure mental workload. So it's unfortunate, but also, I mean, it is unfortunate because it can show a lot of different things, but it depends on the study that you have. Uh, if all you're showing people are commercials, let's say, and you want to see their pupil, you know that you're not measuring, you're probably not measuring mental workload. Because if I'm sitting there and looking, let's say, at pictures, my mental workload is really low, you're not measuring mental workload, that would be my engagement or excitement or arousal. 
Meta workload is an interesting phenomenon. It, it, it usually, we like to measure it in situations with high cognitive demands. So things like, things that have high critical consequences. So when we have studies in a, in a, in a, um, in a, in a cockpit, yes, or, or driving situation, or healthcare, that's when this is actually important. But usually it's, it's, it's not that often used for that. I talked yesterday a little bit about the cognitive processing measure that is average fixation duration. And by that, I just mean, so the size of the, the, size of the circle indicates the, the, the um, duration of the fixation. So the longer fixations, that means that basically I was there looking at this particular spot a little bit longer than the shorter fixations. And that means it, it indicates a little bit more cognitive processing. And that could be related sometimes to information density. Uh, like when we test patient inserts, you know, when you get a new medication or a new medical device and you take that thing out of the box and there's this patient insert that you have to like fold out like a big map and you look at it and it's so dense and the, 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 the print is so tiny, the fixations that we get on this are just huge because the fixation duration is a lot longer than it probably should be. In this study, um, think of reading medication labels. And this is a study um, that we did, and this is an example. These are the existing label. Oh, at the time, they were existing. Now they're old labels for a particular company. Uh, and this is just one example. They had to uh, pick out, let's see, one, two, three, four. This was the, the answer to the task, to a particular task. And in this case, the new, the new labels produced a lot shorter fixations. Obviously, we didn't just figure out that they were shorter by looking at the size of the circle. We, we looked at the numbers, and this is just an illustration for it. And we, we made a lot of changes to these labels. We standardized them a little bit. Uh, we decreased the information density, increased contrast, uh, got rid of all caps, a lot of things we did to, to decrease that fixation duration and thus cognitive processing on the pharmacist. So when you're looking for something on the page, let's say, okay, so in this particular um, task, the task was the participant added several, this is a st stock photo website, they added uh, a bunch of pictures to their cart or to, because they wanted to buy them and the task is to actually go ahead and buy them. And this is the target. They're supposed to click on my object. But the participant, what the participant does is they go, and this is a hypothetical gaze spot that I actually drew, but a lot of them went here, and they went here, then they went here. Basically, there was a lot of back and forth. Now, everything that happens before they fixate the target, that's related to findability. So this is findability, the time it takes them to get here, the number of fixations it takes them to get here, how easy is it to locate the target. So the number of participants that fixate the target, the number of fixations prior to the target, and time before they reach the target. It's all about findability. Now, in this case, everybody, 95% of participants fixated on the target at least once during the task. And it took them an average of six seconds to get there. Six seconds, that's a lot of time before you find uh, my shopping cart, which is what it is. Now, everything after that, what, let's say they looked at it, but somebody, this person probably said, oh, what, I don't know what that is. So they kept looking here where they expected the, the thing. So this is related to recognition or recognizability. Um, and that can be measured by the number of gaze visits to the target before it gets found. A lot of times you can see when, there is, when something is labeled impro improperly, a lot of participants look at it and they, and they go, no, probably not. And I'm like, I'm just, nobody is thinking that, but they go, eh. they go somewhere else and they come back to it. So you can see that they, they look at something multiple times and come back to it and then go away. So the number of visits, also time from first fixation on the target to finally when they figure out, oh, that's what I was looking for, and they, they select it. So in this case, no participants recognize the target on their first visit, so when everybody looked at it first, nobody really clicked on it. Um, and they took them on average 2.5 target visits, so 2.5 times they had to come back to it to finally figure out what it was. So we know from this example that both look 
findability and recognizability are a problem. And again, this is a pretty simple example that you, you didn't need eye tracking to, to be able to figure this out. But it's an easy example because, first of all, nobody ex expects their shopping cart to be here, but to be here. So localization is difficult. And recognizing it, the labeling is pretty poor as well. In this particular study, um, in this, this task, there were several tasks. The task here was to find which motor oil is best for your car. And the target was here. This, is, this was the target. So this was where the participants were supposed to go to figure out the answer to the task. And I usually do a kind of a funnel like this. So 100% of people attempted the task. Now 71% actually looked at it, but only seven selected it. So this is our effectiveness. This one is about findability, so how many people actually found it, and this is how many people recognized it. And on this side, we have the efficiency of, of localization and then the recognition. So this is not the very successful task, right? Seven people, seven percent of people only figured it out, that you have to go here to figure out uh, the answer to the task. In this case, we had four different designs. And we had several, so the client basically gave us a list of tasks, key tasks, that people need to be able to do on this website. And we wanted to see which design does best on each of these tasks. So this particular design number C, so homepage number C, and the, 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 the differences were a little subtle. So you can't quite tell, but some of the verbiage was different, et cetera. But in C, there were two targets. So both of these links would take you to the answer. So do you know which one? Yep, so it basically looks like I'm looking at this. So in terms of effectiveness, this one, this design would be best in this case. But still not that great, because not everybody <laughs> figured it out. But that's what we do with the, with the results. That's how we can compare it, the findability and recognizability across multiple designs. So key takeaways, measures are used in summative studies to make decisions between designs or maybe does our design meet the benchmarks that we set for our design. Every measure has a meaning, it indicates a cognitive process. The measures have to be selected carefully to match research questions. We have measures of attraction and performance. This is the classification of measures. This is something that um, a lot of academics would frown upon. There are a lot of classifications of eye tracking measures, but they're not very practical. They're not for user experience researchers. They're just, they're very academic. And um, they would say that this is oversimplified, uh, but that's okay. I, I, I'm here to talk, I usually talk to people who do this uh, for practical reasons. And statistical analysis is necessary. People think that they can just get the measures, get the numbers out, and they say, well, it took them two seconds to find this, it took them 2.2 seconds to find this, therefore, this one's better. Well, we don't know that for sure. So I don't know what your experience is with statistics, but if you just get the numbers out of it and you look at the numerical difference, that's not good enough. We have to use some inferential statistics, such as chi-square, t-test, ANOVA, et cetera. Does that ring a bell? Anybody has any experience with psychology, behavioral sciences? Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, so if you want to know more about it, that is actually a really good website, measuringusability.com. I don't know if you know about Jeff Soro. Yeah, I have a couple of us. It's really great. A lot of interesting science in how to turn usability into a measurable thing. It's absolutely fantastic. And he, he just um, published a book on statistics for usability. Absolutely brilliant. It's not hard because when you think of statistics, you go, oh man, I took that class in grad school. It was horrible. It really, he makes it very, very accessible to people. And if you want to analyze quantitative eye tracking data, you really need to know statistics. And measuring usability.com. Yeah. Huh, that's a good question. Uh, so I'm done. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows, but I'm working on a book called Eye Tracking the User Experience, and it will be published by Rosenfeld Media. It was supposed to be published in 2012, uh, but since I haven't finished writing it, it's really hard to publish it. 
So, uh, so I've written 13 out of 14 chapters. The last one is due at the end of November, and then it's all to the pub up, up to the publisher. It's all, it's all, and I've been submitting every chapter. Uh, so they have the content already and editing. They are already editing the content. So hopefully the first quarter of 2013. Yep, that's my hope. And that's when I can get my life back. And also in the book, I do refer to measuringusability.com and Jeff Sora and his book because my book can't be possibly talking about all of that. Um, yeah, this really just talks about statistics, p-values, what's different, interpreting, describing results. And heat maps are usually the backdrop to my data. Like, for example, in this case, we were comparing Google to Bing for certain, it was when Bing, Bing came out and people wanted, it was such a huge hype, we wanted to see what the difference was. And um, in this case, the heat maps are there, but we didn't use them for analysis. We looked at, so here are areas of interest, uh, the navigation here, the sponsored links, uh, the body here, et cetera. Hit rate means how many participants looked, and then um, how much time they spent, we have as a second one. If there was a difference, for example, when it really mattered was this was done because of the advertising. So we wanted to see, or the client wanted to see where, where it was better to advertise on Google or Bing. So we didn't really find anything that interesting about advertising because here the ads on this side, the sponsored links, the hit rate was 28% versus 21, which we didn't find statistically significant. Um, and per result, the time per result was also, there was no difference. And there were other differences that we found. So. The heat map is there to make it interesting, to make to give people some kind of context about what we're talking about, but it's really not, the results are not about the heat map. The heat map was done to illustrate the results. <laughs>